Well, this morning I've already pretty much read the text. So what I want to do is just read one passage, um, uh, the passage that I was telling you that um, uh, reminds us of what, at least how the disciples viewed this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, what it meant for them. Certainly it meant power, but it also meant that Jesus was in that position to pour out of his Holy Spirit uh, as he said that he would. And what this meant was that Jesus was glorified. So Acts chapter 2, verse 33, uh, Peter in his sermon says this, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this, this which you both see and hear. And of course, this was um, what they saw with regard to um, them speaking in their own languages. Uh, the power, the transformation in their own lives, and of course the conviction that he brought about in the lives of those who were hearing and their desire to trust in Jesus so that 3,000 actually were baptized on that day. Now, this what we're looking at is really going to be somewhat topical, so I'm not going to so much break down this particular verse. This is just opening the theme as these other passages have, but we're going to look at several passages as we go through this uh, particular topic. So let me just begin by saying that last time we were reminded that Jesus, besides being our Savior, is also our example. He is the pattern of what He calls us to be. We might say He's the paradigm. He's the model. We are to model our lives after Him. We are to put on His character, His perfect character, which we know from reading Scripture is the perfect reflection of his father's own flawless moral image. You know, we're not to look like Jesus physically, of course. We are to look like him morally, put on his character. We are to have his love for everything that reflects that holy image that he has. Um, we are to have a love for him. We are to have a love for his father. We are to have a love for his people. We are to have a love for his word and for his worship. And we are to have a hatred for everything that is the opposite of that holy image, what the Bible calls the world, which is under the dominion of the enemy, Satan, uh, and also our flesh, which desires the world. So putting on this character, we are to love what he loves and we are to hate what he hates. We are to be gracious, we are to be merciful, we are to be compassionate like him towards one another and towards all mankind. Now Jesus, of course, is the perfect example of this. He not only models this morality for us in His own life, but He teaches us about it in every page of His Word. And I just want to emphasize that because of all the things we hear going on, people who profess to be Christians and things they're saying about what God likes, what He loves, whom He loves, and so forth, we can't just go by opinions. People have a lot of opinions about these things. And the church today is very confused about these things, about what is right and wrong, about what is good or bad, about whom the Lord will accept and whom He won't accept. The only way we can know what is pleasing to God is by reading Scripture, not by listening to opinion. We need to base our convictions on His truth and not on what people want to believe, because a lot of people typically just believe what they want to believe. Now, Jesus also shows us through his own life what our purpose should be, and our purpose should be the same as his purpose. His one goal was to save those whom the Father had given him. And we're the recipients of that. If we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, He has saved us. Now, Jesus went out to seek His lost sheep, not merely for the sake of the sheep, not merely for our sakes, so that we would escape hell and go to heaven, although that is the benefit of it, not only for His own sake, so that He might have His own people, His sheep, His body, His bride. But He also did this for His Father's sake, that his father might be just, and yet the justifier of those who trust in the Lord Jesus. In other words, that he might be able to forgive us and to give us a perfect righteousness 
so that he might be able to receive us as his sons and daughters without doing any violation to his justice because it was paid for in full by our Lord Jesus. Now, finally, Jesus gave us an example of how to carry out this work. He did it by going out and preaching the gospel. Uh, we are to take that word and bring it to others as well. Uh, those who received his word, he discipled them, those who trusted him, and we are to receive those who believe into the membership of the church, and we are also to help them learn and grow into the image of Jesus. And then there was a third thing Jesus did. He sent those that he had trained out that they might continue his work. And that's part of what we need to do as well. After we've been trained, we need to go out, we need to help train others, and we need to encourage one another to go out and to do the work that our Lord started and tells us to continue until we have reached everyone that we can with the gospel. Now, we noted last time, and this was kind of the climax of last week, that we are never more like Jesus than when, by His grace, we have grown so much into His likeness that we begin sharing His gospel with others. And we talk about living like Jesus, becoming like Jesus. That is what Jesus was all about bringing his gospel to others. And when we begin to do that, then we truly are being made into the image of Jesus. Now, that's, a, again, a very tall order. How can we do it? Well, today we want to be reminded that this is something we cannot do on our own. And Jesus certainly never really expected us to do it on our own. And that's why he gave to us his Holy Spirit so that the Spirit of God might work these things in us. Jesus works from the inside out. I've already made mention of this passage this morning, but Jesus did say to his disciples before he ascended into heaven in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. You know, Sinclair Ferguson was reminding us with regard to the Beatitudes, uh, how, you know, how we look at those are important. Sometimes we look at them as a list of things we are supposed to do and as a list of things that we need to be through our own efforts before the Lord will accept us or will receive the blessings that are connected to those particular Beatitudes. But that's not actually what Jesus is saying. He's basically saying this is what you are and this is what you'll receive. The Lord gives you what it is he wants from you before he asks you to do it. So essentially, that's what we have here. You will receive power and you will be my witnesses. He didn't say, go be my witnesses and then I'll give you power. So the Lord gives us what it is he asks. Augustine had put it this way, Lord, command what you will and give what you command because I can't do it on my own. So today, we're going to look at the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, who is the third person of the triune God, He is a real person, and He is real, and His work is real. He really has been given to us. He really does dwell inside of us if we are trusting Jesus. And He really is working in our lives to make us more like Jesus. But when we're talking about this power now, this power to do evangelism, if we are to receive that kind of power, uh, we need to ask for his help. It's already been given. And we have, we'll, we'll see this evening primarily that uh, even though the day of Pentecost had come and they were empowered then, they still had to pray later. And the Lord gave them more of the Spirit, filled them again. This is something we need to continually be seeking the Lord for. The power of his Holy Spirit, we need to ask we need to believe that he will give the Holy Spirit to us as he promised he would. And then we need to be willing to move forward in the work that he has given us to do. Now, this morning, what I want us to do is look at a brief history of how we lost the Spirit of God in the fall and the consequences of that, but how he was restored to us through Jesus' work and what that brings back to us. And I think as we see what we lost when we lost the Spirit, 
and what we gain when we regain the Spirit, we get a better understanding of what the Spirit of God is actually doing in our lives. Now, this evening, we're going to look at that a little bit more specifically uh, with regard to His work of converting and empowering. But first of all, let's consider the loss of the Spirit and the consequences of that loss. Now, I believe the Bible teaches us that God originally gave us His Holy Spirit when He made us in His image. On the sixth day, we read in Genesis 1, actually, that after God had made everything else, after He had shaped the world, after He had prepared the, the different environments of the world and filled them with His creatures, on the sixth day, after He had made all the other land-dwelling creatures, because on the sixth day He did make everything that dwells on land, He made man. He made somebody who was like Him. We read in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every, uh, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, what this tells us is that when God made us, we were like him. We were his image bearers. But to understand what that means, we need to understand that that image really can be viewed from two different perspectives. Uh, what we call the natural image of God and the moral image of God. And let me just give you a preview here. I'm going to distinguish these two because after the fall, we are still said to be in the image of God. But after the fall, we no longer have the Spirit of God who is the moral image of God that we're going to be looking at. He is the one who makes us like God more than anything else. Now, let me just explain those a little bit more fully. The natural image of God, how God made us like Him, includes several things. Intelligence. He gave us the ability to think or to reason. Purpose. He gave us the ability to desire and to do things, to want to do things. Uh, he gave us consciousness, the awareness of our own existence. Uh, we know that we exist. We know that we're here. Spirituality. We not only have a body, but God also gave us a soul. And by the way, that soul, that immaterial part of us, that spiritual part of us, is where our personality and all these characteristics really exist, where they reside. He made us moral beings. We know the difference between good and evil. And he made us immortal, not in our bodies, but in our souls. We will never cease to be because that's what God has willed. Now, these things are true of God, and these things are true of us, but they are true of us in a lesser kind of way. We are not God, but we are like him in these ways. Now, we are still in the image of God in the sense that I've just mentioned. We all still have those characteristics even after we fell away from God. That's why James can write in James chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. And by the way, there's, there's instruction here beyond what we're looking at. He says, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. I want you to notice James says, after the fall, man is still in the likeness of God. The fact that we are in the image of God still is the basis for capital punishment. A lot of people today don't believe in capital punishment. But God tells us that if someone takes away a life unjustly, if you murder somebody, the only just penalty for that crime is the taking away of your life. And that's based upon the, on, uh, the seriousness of what you've done. You've destroyed the image of God when you've killed somebody. Uh, God says to Noah in Genesis 9, verses 5 and 6, Surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast. I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood... By man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God 
he made man. So that's something that still applies after the fall. Man is still in the image of God. That's why it's such a serious crime to kill someone. That's, this is also, by the way, why God continues to be kind to ungrateful and evil men, why he has an inheritance even for those who will never receive his son and be reconciled to him. Like the rich man, he received his good things in life and Lazarus his bad things, but now Lazarus, after he dies, is in heaven and the rich man is in hell. This is also one of the reasons why we are to offer the gospel to all men because they're in the image of God. But now let's get to the, to the main point. There was something else in this image, in this likeness, something very precious, something that made us most like God, something that we lost in the fall, and that was God's moral image. What we lost was the love for what he loved, for everything good, everything right. And we lost the hatred then, which is, comes along with that love. If you love what's right, then you're going to despise what's wrong. We lost that too. The hatred of everything he hates, everything that is the opposite of what's good and right. Now, you know how it works with us, uh, how we pick out our friends and how we you know, choose to whom we're going to spend time with. We usually do that with people that are most like us, don't we? Uh, the more alike we are, the more we gravitate towards one another. People who share the same interests, who love the same things, the more we're alike, the more we're attracted. Well, think about this. God made us like Him so that we could spend that time together, so that He would want to spend time with us and we would want to spend time with Him. God gravitated towards us because we were in His image. Originally, we were just like Him which is why we were able to have this fellowship in the garden. We had that same moral disposition, the love for the same things. But the reason why we had that was because God had given us His Holy Spirit. Now we read in Genesis 2, verse 7, that the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, in this breathing of, of God, and we actually it might even be the Son of God who, who did this because He was the one who created all things. In this breathing, He was essentially giving to us a couple of different things. And by the way, I think in this breathing, we also have a picture, as I mentioned earlier, of what Jesus would later do to His disciples. Before He ascended into heaven, He breathed on them and He said, receive the Holy Spirit. And that was basically a promise of what was going to happen in Acts chapter 2, which we've already read about. But in this breathing that God does of this man he had created from the dust of the ground, the Lord not only gave Adam a soul that brought his body to life, Adam became a living being, he gave him a sanctified soul. He gave him a soul that loved him. And essentially, that can only happen through God's Holy Spirit. We cannot love God except through His Holy Spirit because He's the only one who gives this kind of love. And by the way, it's, it's only His absence that makes man to be the, the kind of being that He is, the kind of person that He is, which the Bible represents as evil. He only loves what is evil and He hates what is, what is good. Now, this is what happened in the fall. Man lost the spirit, and so he fell away from God, and he became evil. Now, we're not going to read all these verses, but I, I do want to make reference to what happened after the fall. The first thing that happened was when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, their eyes were opened, and they realized, at least if you, if you read the text, it says they realized or they saw that they were naked which we tend to interpret as they saw they didn't have any clothes. Well, it, it wasn't that they became aware for the first time in their existence that they weren't wearing clothes. I mean, they would have had to have been blind not to see that they weren't wearing clothes. But their loss of God's spirit made them sense another kind of nakedness, an exposure to something. The guilt brought their awareness that they were under God's wrath. They had disobeyed God. They lost their innocence. They lost the spirit. 
and now suddenly they feel exposed by their sin and their guilt. Now, the first thing they did was they, they tried to put together some leaves and cover over their nakedness, again, perceiving that somehow if they covered their body, that would fix the problem. They tried to fix the problem with their own efforts. Okay, I, I'm exposed now. I'm going to try to make it right again. So I'll do something to fix it. But the problem is it didn't work. And when they heard God come down, in what we read in Genesis 3, it's called the cool of the day, when it sounds like he's coming down to have his, his evening walk with Adam and Eve, which he apparently did during the time they had this fellowship together. Uh, that's not what he came down for, and that's not what it was talking about. He came down, more accurately translated, in the spirit of the day, the day of his judgment. And that's why when they heard his voice in the garden, they tried to hide from him. Now, let me ask whether or not that sounds familiar. I mean, isn't that what we were doing before the Lord had mercy on us? We were trying to kind of do enough stuff to make ourselves acceptable to God, you know, put together our collection of works and hand it to Him. Isn't this good enough to, you know, uh, somehow uh, avoid your judgment? And uh, the other thing, of course, that we were experiencing was the fear of that judgment. And you know, we were trying to sew our fig leaves together, and we were trying to hide from God. That's the effect of the loss of the Holy Spirit and the effects of sin. Man lost the moral image of God. He lost the Holy Spirit. Now, man didn't lose, we didn't lose our ability to be moral. I mean, we are still moral beings. People do moral things. But the Bible says we're morally corrupt, that we now love evil and hate good. Paul writes, has a description of the whole human race, in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, this described us before Jesus had mercy upon us. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. Even with all this religiosity and all this worship going on in the world, no one is seeking the true God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. So we lost the spirit, we lost our moral goodness, and that's why we can't do anything to save ourselves. We can't even do anything to receive the offer of salvation that God makes to us in the gospel. God is good, and we don't want what is good. So that is the result of the loss of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand that to understand what his being brought back actually accomplishes so, as I mentioned, what we lost, God had a plan to restore through Jesus. And by the way, he made that clear to Adam and Eve from the very beginning. When he pronounced the curse on the serpent who attempted Eve to eat of the tree to disobey God, Genesis 3.15 is the very first announcement of the gospel. Right at the time when they fall away from the Lord, God is already intervening with his, with his mercy and grace. Listen to what he says to the serpent in Genesis 3.15. He says, I will put enmity between you, hatred, between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, what, what he's saying here is this. When the woman obeyed Satan, obeyed the serpent, he sided with her or with, with him, became a part of his kingdom. But when God says, I am going to put enmity between you and the woman. He's speaking to the serpent. They were together. Now I'm going to put hatred between you, which means I'm going to redeem the woman back to myself. And that's, that's what he did. He said, secondly, he was intending to redeem others to himself as well. He continues, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. So there are going to be the children of the serpent, and those are the ones in the kingdom of darkness. And there were going to be the children of the woman and by the way, all of these children of the serpent and the children of the woman were going to come through Eve because she was the mother of all the living, but there were going to be those who loved the Lord and those who didn't love the Lord. And the reason why the Lord was going to do this was because of one who was going to come through her family line who would crush the head of the serpent. He says, he shall bruise you, or more literally, crush your head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, we have the rest of the story in the Bible of how this all works out. We know the seed of the woman is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We know that he dealt a crushing blow to our enemy on the cross, and it cost him his life to do it. But in doing so, he freed us from his power. He crushed the head of the servant, redeemed us to himself. Now, the fact that God was going to fulfill that promise was so certain that he began to apply it long before Jesus actually came into the world. Uh, we, we see a picture of that very early on. The, the, uh, God is basically showing Adam and Eve what he's intending on doing when he did this. We read in Genesis 3, verse 21, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. God took one of his living creatures and he killed it. You have to kill the animal to get the skin off of it. He made a blood sacrifice to show that the wages of sin is death. You, you sin, there has to be a death. And to, to show that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. It has to be a blood sacrifice. It has to be animal life that has to be given. And by the way, that animal life was only meant to be a picture of the blood that the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, would willingly pour out in the future on the cross, and it was through his death that he dealt that blow to Satan. Now, he took the skins of these animals and he clothed Adam and Eve's nakedness to show them how Jesus would cover their nakedness with his righteousness. Along with these promises and the works that they represented, the work they represented, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, also came the return of the Holy Spirit. Because again, Eve now was hated Satan, which means that if she hated him, she must have a love for the Lord. And if she was to have seed, she was, she was to have children that were in her camp, they had to love the Lord as well. When God made the sacrifices, he clothed Adam and Eve. And so they had the Holy Spirit. Now, they didn't have the Holy Spirit like they had him in the garden. They weren't quite as full, not nearly as full. If they had, they would have been perfectly sanctified but they weren't. There was still some absence of the Spirit. But there was a big change in their lives. They were no longer running from God and hiding from God, but now they began to worship Him. They even began to keep the Sabbath that He had originally created for them and, and blessed for them. Uh, we read in Genesis 2, verses 1 and 3, this is the establishment of the Sabbath, thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts by the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Now, God sanctified and blessed this day not for himself, but for his creation. And we know when we get, it's spelled out a little more clearly, when we get to... Um, the Ten Commandments, Mount Sinai, when God gives His Sabbaths, again, it's a part of the Ten Commandments and so forth. But I point this out to say that Adam and Eve, after the Lord did this work in their lives, began to observe this Sabbath. In Genesis 4.3, we actually see the whole family was doing it. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Now, on the surface, that may not necessarily tell you what I just said, but the course of time literally means at the end of days. At the end of days, they brought these sacrifices. It wasn't just Cain, but also Abel. And we assume that Adam and Eve were also worshiping as well. At the end of days really refers to the sequence of days that God had established from the very beginning. Work six days and rest on the seventh. So they were resting on the seventh and they were worshiping God. The Holy Spirit had returned, and he had turned their lives back around again towards God, and he came because of the work that Jesus was going to do in the future. But now Jesus' work also brought what we read about in, in Acts 2, verse 33, not just the return of the Holy Spirit, but the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Spirit in a much greater way to enable the church to do what Jesus actually began to do um, when he left the world. Now, notice what Peter again says in our passage, Acts 2, 33. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from his Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this 
which you both see and hear. The disciples recognized that this outpouring on the spirit of the day of Pentecost was the evidence that Jesus had been exalted. But it was also the fulfillment of the promise Jesus made to empower his church to do what he has called us to do, which is essentially to reach out to others with the gospel. Now, just a, a couple of things. This, this distinguishes a whole new epoch, a whole new arrangement in God's plan. In the Old Covenant, perhaps the Spirit wasn't needed as much, with, perhaps with as much power as He is needed today because evangelism was more magnetic in its, in its character. Uh, if somebody wanted to know the true God, they had to go to where the true God was worshipped, and that was to the Jews in Palestine. So the Jews weren't going out and doing missionary work. People were coming to Israel. It would kind of be nice if that were the way it was, but sometimes we kind of think it's that way, don't we? we? We think that kind of this is Israel and God's just going to bring people into the church and we just have to sit and wait for them. You know, we'll just turn up the magnetism and pray that the Lord will bring them and, and the Lord will, will bring them, but that's not the way it works. In the New Covenant, evangelism is, is more like radiation, it's, it's radiant. Jesus sends us out to where the people are in order to bring them in. And to do that work, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And this evening, we're going to look more at that. Uh, the work the Spirit of God does, how He changes our lives and brings us to Jesus, but how He also turns it up the very things that he gives us to bring to Jesus are the very things he turns up to give us the power to go and do what he actually calls us to do. We need the Holy Spirit. And as we prepare now to come to the table, I just want to remind you that this is the reason we have the Holy Spirit, okay? is because Jesus came and he obeyed and he died in order that he might save us in order that he might be exalted, in order that he might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit and pour him out upon us. So let's think about that in particular as we um, prepare to come to the table. First of all, let's, let's, um, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us to apply what we've just seen. And then I'd like to again read uh, from 1 Corinthians um, 11 passage about the institution of the supper. Uh, before we come to the table. Okay, so first of all, let's, let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard.